nothing gives you more power and authority than authoring a book, but your audience needs to see that as well. It's mine. It's my precious. And then it's like, boom, I have a book. 80% of our decision is the author. Who are you? What are you doing? And why? Then I could make the appropriate decision for the publisher that aligned best for that mission. I'm never going to write another book because I got three in me and I'm done. What was the pivot from I'm never writing another book again to, okay, I wrote three more books. I'm a big fan of putting all your best stuff in a book. Give it all away. All of your secrets away. The book needs to serve the reader 100%. So I am honored to have David Hancock of Morgan James Publishing, the publisher that we signed with for Silence Your Inner Critic. We are so excited. And David has been instrumental in that. His heart-centered nature and his unique approach to bringing books into publication is exactly what won us over and the reason that we cannot imagine being anywhere else except in the Morgan James family. So David, thank you. I know you are a very, very busy man and you're taking the time to come and share the Morgan James story, your story, and our connected story in this podcast. So I just really yeah. appreciate you. Absolutely. It's my privilege to be here. I love you guys. In fact, I don't say this really publicly that often, but 80% of our decision is the author. You know, who are you? What are you doing? And why? That is super important to us because we only do a limited number of books each year. It's like three a week. And that is part of the reason why we have such a great relationship with our authors. It's also part of the reason why we are able to select some great books because the authors are engaged. They're passionate. They're the right people saying the right thing at the right time in the right platform. But then the icing on the cake for us, which you guys do really well, is how is that book connected to the bigger picture? How am I going to, or how are you going to connect with your reader, have that engagement with them, have a real relationship with them so you can further them down their path? Because the way we look at it is the more we can help you be successful, the more we'll be successful. And I know you feel the same way. The more you can help your audience accomplish their goals, your goals can be met, which then our goals will be met. And then their goals. It's a great cycle. It's a beautiful <laughs> loop, isn't it? It is. It I, is. I don't know why we don't get this more often, but absolutely. So then the other 20% is the book because you can always hire a better editor, right? Heck, you can delete it and start over with a new ghostwriter, but you can't fix an author that doesn't care. I love that. <laughs> and having been around authors who, and I know you, when we had our initial conversation, this is one of the things you said. It's you hold this thing, that you, this baby that you've created so close to your chest. Right. right. It's, it's, it's mine. Right. It's my precious. And then it's like, boom, I have a book. Yeah. And you have definitely done a wonderful job of guiding us to say, no, this is a shared process. Your community is what helped you be inspired to write this book and your life experience. So why would you not share all of this with your community again? Yeah. So, because there's two bridges you've got to cross as an authority figure. You know, in fact, one of them is the authority bridge. So between now and the time you really want your audience to do something is you've got to earn the right. And you need to, to educate them, encourage them, inspire them, maybe even you know, share the wisdom, demonstrate that you're the right, the right person and the right content at the right time. But it's slow. I mean, nothing gives you more power and authority than authoring a book. But your audience needs to see that as well. So you've got to tell them and you don't need to sell them yet. Just plant seeds, just build up that relationship, build up the rapport, build up that value. And so that when you're finally ready to say, hey, it's time to go pre-order the book. Hey, the publisher's on my back, you know, go pre-order the book. They'll do it because you cross bridge two, which I lovingly call the permissions bridge, where you've earned the right to ask. You've earned permission to have your audience follow you down this path that does include a, you know, less than $20 commitment, but it's a commitment. Because if you do what you just said a minute ago, where people will hold it real close to their chest and bounce out of the blue out of nowhere and say, hey, I'm a book, serve me, help me be this, you know, person versus serving them. It's, it can crash back down to the earth really, really quick. Well, yeah, I think it's the same way for daily life, right? If you're not sharing and you have no idea what's going on in someone's life, then all of a sudden you're like, hey, help me with this major milestone in my life. Everyone already has things going on and they have their own milestones. And now you just want to say, your life, okay, put that on hold in service of my life. 
No, yeah. this way we create something amazing together. That's and right. It feels like it's our book as it goes out because it is. Yeah. And then you have you know, a, a great relationship for months and years thereafter versus a you know shot to maybe number one on Amazon to just crashing back down to the ocean when you realize that you lose subscribers, lose relationships, and are not really adding value to others. <laughs> exactly. So a huge part of what had a sign with Morgan James is two part you individually. So I would love it if you would share a little bit of your own story and what brought you to a point of creating Morgan James in the first place. And then what makes Morgan James different? Why, what sets you apart in this quickly, um, many people coming onto the scene to publish books in multiple different categories, but you guys have what, 25 years? Did you just celebrate 25 years? Just celebrated 20. So we're in our 21st year now. 21st year. I'm making yeah. you older than you are. I'm sorry. That's all. Okay. <laughs> I just know you'll be around forever. So <laughs> That's right. So you definitely have a foothold in the marketplace. Can you share a little bit about Morgan James and how you got that foothold, but first the story of what led into it? Yeah. And the cool thing is that they're, they're intertwined. So I was, I won't go back to birth because it's a really great story. And, and funny thing is, is as often as I speak out there, the biggest thing I speak about is people want to know the story. So it's, it's interesting to me because it's just, it just happened. A lot of God's favor, a lot of opportunities, a lot of great people helped me along the way. But short version is I was a banker back in the nineties, fat, dumb, and happy, never ever imagined doing anything else. I mean, they were paying me stupid money for a college dropout, <laughs> but I was just having success and it was fun, but it wasn't until my bosses started to lean into me to do more. I'm like, I'm doing all I can. Um, but they also wanted me to hire people and train them to do what I'm doing. I'm like, yeah, that sounds great, but I don't even know why I'm successful. <laughs> yeah. How do I put it on paper? I know. Right. It's just like, <laughs> I'm lucky. I don't know. You know, uh, again, a lot of how I got to where that point was is kind of interesting and bumps and nudges and whatnot, but we can talk about that later. But uh, so I'm like, I need to figure out what it is that's making me successful. So for the first time in my life, in essence, I, I went out to, to study anything, it, what, what, trying to find something, you know? So I went out and I, I bought books. I read books, Tom Hopkins, Zig Ziglar, uh, John Maxwell, Bill Backrack, Todd Duncan, you name it. I bought their books. I implemented the things they were teaching. I went to their seminars. I bought their courses and all of it was wonderful. I hired assistants. It made my life easier. I fine-tuned some processes. I made a little bit more money. I went home a little bit earlier, but nothing really gave me that feeling like, this is what's me. This is why I'm successful. Um, so it was a little frustrating, but I just continued down that, that path of self-improvement, self-discovery. But it wasn't until I discovered one book that ended up absolutely changing my career and then absolutely changed my career, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yes. So my whole staff knew what I was doing. I was on this path and, 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 and I was growing and I was hiring and I was training and I was, and it was just, this is just a part of who I am now. But one day I came to work and there was a copy of the book called Guerrilla Marketing on my desk. Now, Guerrilla Marketing, I had never heard of, never ever heard of Jay Conrad Levinson, didn't even know what it was. But Guerrilla Marketing, for those that you don't know, is a book and it was based on um, leveraging your time, your energy, your imagination and relationships to gain conventional goals instead of using money. You're looking for um, serving others, um, obviously creating out of the box thinking, creating real value, memorable things, but not cheesy things. And it's like, I just re really resonated with guerrilla marketing. And so much so that I just immersed myself in guerrilla marketing. I mean, I looked for every book on it. I, if it had the letter G and the M next to it, I bought it, read it, ate it, slept with it, did what it said. I did not really immerse myself in it. And uh, one of the books called guerrilla marketing in the nineties, cause this was the nineties, um, Jay, the author said, Hey, if you have questions, email me <laughs> or let me know, you know, ask me questions. So I emailed them jview at aol.com. And he was, well, that's, that's true. Nineties, nineties. <laughs> that's right. Uh, funny story about how he, no, but you know, how he came up with that email address. But anyway, so I emailed him and he responded and we just became pen pals and you know, buddies during, you know, over the email, he answered lots of questions and, and it was just great, but I ended up hiring him as a coach and he didn't necessarily teach me anything more than I had already learned or been doing just because that was my nature. But his story says accountability, the affirmation that this is something and it's called guerrilla marketing and it's definitely very duplicatable was incredible. 
But over the months that he was teaching me, he basically taught me one more thing that I hadn't been doing. And he spread it out over several months because I'm paying him thousands of dollars to be my coach, right? So he's a smart coach. (laughs) But he said, David, basically, if you want to charge more and negotiate less for what you're doing, like who doesn't? I mean, that's who doesn't want to charge more and negotiate less, right? If you're selling any widget. I'm like, yeah, sign me up. He says, well, you got to keep doing what you're doing because it's working. You're having impact. You're creating relationships. You're adding value. You're serving others. You're helping others. you're, You're on your way there, but you need to add one more thing. And I'm like, yes, what is this one more thing? course, I'm paying him monthly. So he didn't tell me right away. (laughs) So he went on in another month, kind of similar conversation. He said, David, if you wanted to have those clients that you wished you could do business with, those clients that, you know, that, um, uh, that just right now don't know you exist or you're not big enough for them. And like, oh yeah, there were some, I was in real estate. So uh, mortgage banking. And I'm like, yeah, there were celebrity real estate agents that I wish I could get their business from. Even though I was a top producer, I wasn't getting their business. So there were big attorneys who knew where all the money was or CPAs who knew all the big houses kind of thing. I'm like, yeah, I'd like to have that business. Uh, he said, well, you got to keep doing what you're doing to get it. Cause you're again, you're adding value. You're creating a relationship. You're creating a name for yourself. You're having impact, yada, yada, yada. He says, but you need to add one more thing. And I'm like, What's just one more thing? Now, you guys can probably go where I'm going. But he dragged it out another month. Same thing. He said, David, if you wanted to have the media call you when something happened in your space. And like, yeah, I, I remember the bobbleheads on television, the, the newspaper articles or radio stations. You know, I, I, I never saw that as me, but I, I could comprehend that. He said, well, David, if you want to be that guy, you need to keep doing what you're doing because you're having impact, you know, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like ready to scream. And he says, you need, just, you need to add one more thing. And I'm like, Jay, what is this one more thing? And he just blurted out, you need to write a book. <laughs> and I I laughed out loud and cried inside at the same time. I'm like, who am I to write a book? What do I have to say? You know, I, I barely passed high school, definitely barely passed English. I was too busy chasing soccer balls and my now wife of 34 years. And yeah, I just, I even dropped out of college. So I thought it was 13th grade. I just, it wasn't for me. I'm like, well, who, would I, who would I to write a book? Jay was very loving, very gracious. He helped me realize that that doesn't matter. It's who I am today. It's the message I'm serving. And that, yes, I should write a book and I add value and people need to get to know me. And I'm like, wow, I could do this. And he helped me with an outline. I ended up writing a book. did it like 30 days. I wouldn't recommend everybody try to write the book in 30 days, but it worked for me. I I spent maybe 15 minutes in the evening sitting on the couch with my bride and I just tapped away at, you know, basically a pre-written outline that uh, Jay helped me with and just knocked the book out. Didn't realize that was a hard thing to do. And then I ended up getting it published. Didn't realize that was a hard thing to do either. Got picked up by a New York house and got paid a little advance and, you know, got the book done. And it worked. In less than eight months, all the things that Jay had said happened. I literally doubled my income. Nobody negotiated my fee with me anymore. Uh, Clients that I never could get their attention were begging to get on my calendar. And I swallowed my pride. I took their money, of course, but (laughs) I served them well. Uh, And then sure enough, media called me regularly, weekly. I was either interviewed on television or radio or in the newspaper every week. And I became, you know, that guy. It was like, it was almost laughable, but amazing. My business just grew. Uh, but, <laughs> but the relationship with the publisher was, was lacking. It was a traditional house. They bought all the rights and they did with it as they pleased. Now they did a, g- a good job, but I had very little involved in the entire process. I sold them the rights. They came up with the title, the subtitle, how the book should look like, price, size, format, all that was done on their end. I had very little input in anything. And what happened was when I got my sample advanced reader copies in the mail, just a few weeks before pub date, they added three chapters to the book. I didn't write it. <laughs> I, Where did these come from? I don't know. I could have written it. And of course, when I tried to get the explanation, I said, well, you know, it was just quicker if we just, you know, hired somebody. To, you know, it's like, seriously? Uh, but it worked. Uh, but it was very frustrating. And the biggest conversation I had with the publisher was I wasn't selling enough books and no, I can't buy any more at a discount because I've already bought more than I'm supposed to at a discount. And who are you again? <laughs> or you need permission to do that kind of thing. And it just was not fun. So I'm like... Forgetting all about the publishing and just leaning into the, the, the authority status, building relations to add and value. Life was great. So tens, tens of thousands of copies. It was really good. But it wasn't until one day. Well, I say, but it wasn't. There's a cup. There's this building up on it. Um, and I, I promise to answer your question. I just, I'm getting there. <laughs> well, you are. You're telling your story, which was the first part of the question. Okay, good. Because I just, <laughs> shoot, I can't shoot, I'm on track. <laughs> So then, you know, the book was doing okay. I was doing great as a banker and I'm like done with writing books, never going to write another book. I don't need to write another book. And I'm still, you know, leaning into Jay as my business coach. Well, then one day the publisher tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hey, Dave, it's time for book two. I'm like, yeah, not with you. (laughs) (laughs) One, I'm not ready to write another book. I don't know what that is. And two, I, I, no, I don't want to. 
And they not so lovingly reminded me like on page 38 of the publishing agreement that I gave them first rights of refusal for three books, for a three book deal. I'm like, oh, crud. So I you know, like did not want to do it. I go to Jay and I'm whining like a five-year-old kid. I'm like, I don't want to do another book with them. I don't like them. They don't like me, you know, kind of thing. And he, again, gracious self, he says, well, David, you got to, and we'll get it through together. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. And I'm like, no, not unless you co-author it with me. Kind of like, again, whining like a five-year-old boy. And he said, yes. <laughs> I know, right? That's the power of don't ask, don't get, right? So Jay said yes, and uh, ended up my second and third books were co-authored in the Gorilla series called Gorilla Marketing for Mortgage Brokers. But even with that second book, we, we just struggled with the relationship. Now, cool thing was he stopped charging me ten grand a month to be his coach because now we're co-authors and friends. So that was that was wonderful. Um, but we struggled every decision from whether it was the, the camouflage motif that had become so famous for the Gorilla Marketing books, you know, or just the way that that Gorilla Marketing described and talked about. We just fought over everything. Won some things, but it was just it was an uphill battle. It wasn't fun. And really, again, the conversations I was having with the publisher was. Uh, you need permission to to do a PowerPoint. You can only buy X number, 500, it was 500 copies. I only buy 500 copies at a discount and sell more books. <laughs> now I sold 40,000 copies to the bank I work for. They bought them for all of our clients. So I'm like, we were doing great, but it was really, really frustrating. Yeah. And then it came time for the third book. And it was obviously going to be a second edition of that first, you know, Gorilla book that I did with Jay. And this is where the, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back for me. So, Mark, Gorilla Marketing book coming out in the year 2000. This is about the time frame. And we get an email, <laughs> ironically, we get an e email in April of 99 from the publisher saying, hey, yeah, hey guys, we need you to remove everything about the internet from your book. No internet, no World Wide Web, no email, no chat rooms, no forums, no nothing related to the internet because we think the internet's going to die on Y2K. You guys, may, some of you may remember the Y2K bug. It was real. You know, there were issues with the way computer systems were written pre-2000 and the way they needed to be written post-2000, but I don't think anybody in their right mind thought that we were going to lose the internet, except my publisher. They thought we were all going to go back to snail mail and fax machines. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so needless to say, that book came out. It did all right, but in our minds, it was a complete utter failure. But like, I'm done with that publisher. I don't have any more book. I am, you know, what do I need a publisher for? I'm a best-selling author. Careful, pride cometh before fall, right? So anyhow, you know, I go out and I'm like, I'm never going to write another book because I got three in me and I'm done. I'm doing really well and, and having lots of fun. And even along those years that I was writing, I, I started to lean, and this is kind of answering the part of the second question, is I started to really lean into that whole, oh my gosh, that book is a powerful, we call it weapon in guerrilla marketing, to really establish our dominance in a certain space and just do things differently. So I started to, anybody that would listen to me, I would talk to them about the power of the book. And then when I got promoted to the wholesale side of the banking, I would teach my clients the things that I did to make me successful. You know, and I helped them grow their business. I would give them guerrilla marketing coaching and like one of the best weapons that I could help them, you know, because the more I could help them succeed, the more business they did, the better they did, the better I did. I mean, that's just that's just who I am. And like, you need to write a book. So I started to plant seeds of, of clients, you know, writing books and. I started playing this whole space of maybe getting them connected with agents or self-publishing or finding, you know, all the while recognizing that there are obstacles with all of it, you know, and it was just, it just became a big part of, you know, the conversations that you got stuck with if you got stuck with me in an elevator. Um, but on that, um, I forgot where I was going with that thing. So uh, the straw that broke the camel's back was the, the internet thing. So I went out and started teaching more about the books just because I was helping them. Then, then, you know, something happened. I decided to write more books. <laughs> so then I went out and self-published about three books. There, I'm an expert. I got six books under my belt. Okay. But I published, so I have know. to ask, though, just to get a little more clarity. Yes, yeah, sorry. What was the pivot from I'm never writing another book again to, okay, I wrote three more books. Is it like childbirth for women? Somehow you just forget the pain and over time and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this again or. Yes, absolutely. that. Or I got interested in a topic. Like I should write a book about that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Some I'm strange do it. That's right. Cause you know, you, you, you get, it does get in your blood. Yeah. You know? So I wrote a handful of business books, fun books, and they were great. They were exactly what I wanted. I was in control of everything and I'm not a control freak, but when you lose control, you kind of you know, go the other way and they were phenomenal books. But <laughs> there's that but again, you know, there's always pros and cons to every decision you make, we make as humans, right? So I realized there were a lot of things I really loved about my traditional experience. Credibility, distribution, opportunity was all amazing. Lack of relationship, lack of help was very frustrating. But when I self-published the book, I thought 
this was going to be the sweet spot for me. You know, I had already earned credibility. I already earned bookstores. I was already doing well. Either surely people would want to buy my new books, but it was a challenge. You know, I, I, what I didn't realize is I couldn't get my self-published book into bookstores. And that's where the book, obviously Amazon was in its infancy, but that's where the bulk of my books have sold before. And, um, I, the media would not interview me on my self-published books. Even the, these, these guys and cows were friends. You know, they would interview me on a regular basis, but they could not talk to me about my new topics I was talking about because I wasn't vetted by a third party. In fact, their producers required that the experts, those talking heads on the show, be vetted in their space so that we can say they're an expert because of this. But they don't have time or energy to go vet their their guests. They let the you know third party publishers do that or things like that. And so it was very frustrating. And then I just couldn't sell the quantity of books that I was selling before. In fact, humbly speaking, uh, the termites were eating my copies of my books in my garage faster than I could sell them. (laughs) I threw away like 1,700 books because the termites got them. So that was very humbling and very frustrating. And it was like, man, it's not fun, not fun anymore. So what do I do? I go back to Jay, my dear friend. You know, we're still friends and we're in communication all the time, of course. So I go back to Jay and I'm like crying and whining like a five-year-old again. I'm like, oh, this is not fun. This is not going as I expected. What do I do? There needs to be a better way for we entrepreneurs, because we entrepreneurs are different, you know, to publish books. And in, in his grace and his loving mindset, he said, well, why don't you put an outline together for what you think that relationship with a traditional house could look like, what you would expect from the publisher, what you expect from the author, how you think that relationship should look like. And I'll take it to Houghton Mifflin, who was the original publisher of Guerrilla Marketing. In fact, Houghton Mifflin published the first four editions. I met Jay in the second, fourth one was a, a, um, uh, dedicated to me. In the fifth edition, we published. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, so I, I put this outline together and I pour my heart and soul into it. I'm like, you know, guerrilla marketing this and values based this and, you know, serving others and helping others realize their goals. And you just really just poured my heart and soul in it. And authors retain their intellectual property because we entrepreneurs need and want to do other things around our content, um, make decisions together because a certain branding makes sense to who we already are versus just whatever the publisher wants to do. And, and just really built that in there. Then also the biggest thing was the old crud now, what, how, I never had a publisher tell me how I could sell books, but I always had publishers tell me that I wasn't selling enough. So let's figure out how do we tell authors how to sell more books, you know, help them down that path. And I present it with Jay, like, ta-da, here you go. Here's the and holy grail. <laughs> here's the holy grail. That's right. I mean, I poured my heart and so on. And I'm like, here, go take it to Houghton Mifflin and we'll all have a place to publish. And he loved it, but said three words that was unexpected. He said, now go do it. Okay, four words uh, that was unexpected. <laughs> and I'm like, <gasps> okay. And we did. So we launched Morgan James, which is my kids' names, based on that outline of, man, I really want to look and feel and smell like a traditional house, though I wasn't there yet. But I wanted to add value to the author, stay the heck out of the way of their entrepreneurship and just have that relationship to help them succeed. I didn't quit my day job as a banker because that's where I'm making my money. I just was very passionate about helping others do what I did so they could grow their business and it'd be very rewarding. And maybe I'd make a little money. Well, that was 2003. <laughs> but and we had just a lot of favor and a lot of friends. I always tell entrepreneurs that you're not a successful entrepreneur until you realize that it doesn't have to be a solo entrepreneur thing. We get where we're going with a lot of help from a lot of our friends. Yeah. That's exactly what happened to me. So Jay gave us like a three book deal. He had some eBooks that weren't published that we published which were phenomenal, did really well for us. And then we, I'd made friends along the speaking circuit who gave me, you know, their, a chance (laughs) because, you know, they were having the same trouble that I was, but you know, who am I, but a friend, they thought they'd help out. So a couple of them, in fact, one of them is an author, but the new, uh, Dr. Robin Anthony, you know, he had a book that just came out of print uh, from Penguin. And now we took it off in 2004 and over half a million print later, you know, so yeah, they just gave us a chance and we just earned, you know, the rest. I had to earn the credibility in the space. I had to earn distribution. We just had to earn it all, but we got there because we were helping authors basically realize their goals, which was helping their audience realize their goals. So see how it kind of all goes back and forth. And we just grew it from there. Uh, you know, 2008, uh, we've got 
I think we were called the first hybrid publisher. 2008 also when Publishers Weekly called us, you know, um, or labeled us as one of the best publishers in the nation. In fact, they called us that 10 years or 10 times over the next 20 years and just grew. We had our first four New York Times bestsellers in 2006, had our first number one New York Times bestseller, I think 2011, and just grew and earned it. But the real reason why we're successful is that relationship that we're developing with the authors. You know, now 100% of our books will show up in brick and mortar stores. Now the depth and breadth can vary, of course, but uh, we've got that credibility. We've got that success for the best sellers, but that relationship where we're helping authors realize their goals is the fun that we have, but the joy that we get that funds us to do it another day. Wow, that amazing. was fun. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> It's like defining a relationship, right? When someone says, tell us how you met and like how the years have gone together. You've had 20 plus years of a marriage with something you're very passionate about. And it shows. You're international as well, right? Right. Hi, I'm Amber. Thank you so much for watching. If you could do me just a quick favor and click like and subscribe wherever you are, it helps us more than we can possibly say. Uh, and that was for strategic. You know, back in the day, we were, you know, we, we, we landed distribution by a global distributor by 2007. Amazing story how that even happened. You know, they called us and like, who are you? What are you doing? And how are you selling so many books? I'm like, I don't know. I need help. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we ended up getting picked up by um, actually the nation's largest distri book distributor in the in the globally the second largest. So our distributor had offices strategically located around the country, and they were printing facilities and distribution channels throughout the country. And I'm like, hey, we're there, you know, let's be there too. So we just started to slowly branch out. Um, 2005, we opened up our New York office. Um, partly because I was tired of answering the question, why Virginia? Like I live in Virginia. This is where I started the company. You know what? Why not Virginia? But everybody says, well, why not New York? I'm like, so we opened up our headquarters in New York, uh, and everything doubled. That was kind of like the whole perception of New York was huge. But then we also opened up an office in Nashville, uh, London, uh, Vancouver, Australia, uh, and now Boston. Yeah. So it just, we just kind of went where our distributor was and established you know, relationships in those, those areas and just grew globally. But from a gorilla perspective where we didn't waste time or resources, we just established value in those areas. And it's been a big part of our success, man. We look huge. You know, then we looked huge and you know, a couple of cool gorilla stories and how we did it. But even today we look a lot bigger than we actually are. <laughs> and size doesn't really equal ability to maneuver within a marketplace either. And that's one thing that we had deep discussions about in our initial calls when I was choosing the publisher. All publishers have value. There is, it's aligning with the one that has the value that aligns with you. Yeah. And as you very well pointed out, having a relationship, if you're an author that is about building relationships with your audience, then having a relationship with your publisher is so important. Because it translates fluidly between all on that chain, where if you're a number in a system and you don't know, and one of the things we also talked about, not that this happens, I don't know, I have no, I have not experienced it. I have now, since you brought it into my awareness, heard of it <laughs> happening to someone where they may purchase your book, purchase the rights to your book, and then shelf it because it's not the right time for it to release. And that can break down a relationship actually faster because as authors, you're right, we're entrepreneurs. This is our baby. Yeah. And the last thing you want to do is see your baby shelved and you can't do anything with it. Yeah. And so my next question for you to dive into, because I found this fascinating, is the benefit really if an author is looking to talk to a publisher or shop their information around. And this is where I was when you and I met. I was like, I don't know what's important to me because I've never done this before. Yeah. You being seasoned, you knew what was important because you had experienced it. So can you share with anybody who might be thinking, I would like to write a book. What are some key things that are important to look at if you're talking to a publisher? Yeah. So really any publisher, it's about um, 
where does the book fit? You know, you don't have to have this massive platform. You just need to be writing or, or at least descriptively be writing in the space that's already existing in essence, because mm-hmm. that way the bookstores have a place to put it. Um, but you really need to serve. So be thinking, it's kind of cliche, but you need to be thinking with the end in mind. Where do you, where do you really want the reader to do when they're reading the book? Um, what other products and services that you might offer them to help them, you know, along their path. In fact, the reality is most of us authors, myself included, we earn more income and opportunity because we wrote the book than we ever will from book sales, regardless of how well the book sells. So always be thinking two products ahead, whether it's additional books or courses or a mastermind or keynote speeches, something, because on average, 20% of your audience is going to say yes to whatever you offer them because they want more access to you. And then from a publisher perspective, they want to see that you're engaged in your space. Um, from what I've been able to discover, even from, from us, even the bookstore buyers really today don't care whether you got 15,000 followers on Instagram or 1,500 followers on Instagram. They're looking at engagement. They want to see that an audience is actually paying attention to you as an author. And I don't think you need to be selling from social media. You just need to be establishing that you're the right person in the space. You educate, you encourage, you inspire and entertain. And then the rest of it is just your goals. You know, how you might publish, you've got options. You've got the traditional path. If you can work within those parameters and, and, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing for everybody, just for most entrepreneurs, there were some limitations that weren't really solvable uh, or it could be goal or it could be credibility or distribution. Or if you just want to have a great book to have at the back of the room, that's one thing. Or if you just have a legacy book that you definitely want to make sure that your family and grandkids have, you know, there's, there's paths to publishing, finding out what's really important to you and what your goals are will be the, one of the best ways to start. And then even from there, how do you go further? How do you get picked up by one of those houses or how do you choose which you know path to do is really about timing budget. And again, the goals and the opportunities. Great way to find, you know, a traditional house is to look at some of the favorite books that, that are maybe in the space that you want to write, look at the acknowledgement, see what uh, agent they're complimenting or thanking for bringing the book together and go see if you can get on that, that agent's radar and see if they'll talk to you. It's a challenge today because most publishers want you to be able to already be at a platform where you can sell 300,000 copies of your book, but it's a great, great way to start. And on, the, on like the hybrid side or some something different than just going to Kinko's and publishing it yourself is, um, you know, if you're getting engaged with a hybrid type publisher, make sure you fully understand who's doing what, because there's a lot of hybrids out there now. And, and they, they some of them are really, really good. They have services that they offer. They deliver, deliver, definitely deliver value in what they do. But most the authors are funding everything and they're just producing a book and you're paying for everything. And that may be OK. Uh, or there's houses like us that have like a, uh, even more of a blend where we, you know, we have some skin in the game. We print all the books that are re- required for distribution. We work really closely with the authors on the marketing side. We also invest in consumer direct marketing to support because uh, from a guerrilla marketing perspective, uh, people need to see you four times before they even think they've seen you before to as many as 27 times before they're decided to make a decision point. So all of us doing everything at once at one is really required. Yes. <laughs> and then on the true self-publisher side, you could get an assisted self-publisher who could just help you produce a book and upload it to you know Amazon or or again, you go to Kinko's and print books and sell them out of your garage. All have tremendous value. You just need to figure out what might be right for you and also the audience that you're trying to support. Right. And that's key because I can even speak for myself. I was going through this swirl of what do I do? What do I do? Because I hadn't yet done what you just suggested, which is I knew my purpose for writing the book, but I didn't fully have that whole goal alignment of, okay, what does that do with the rest of my organization and the way that I desire to take other things to market, such as coursework or retreats? We hadn't really looked at the whole spectrum. So once we had that conversation and I really looked at the long haul of the purpose, not just the purpose of the book, but the purpose of how it fits into the scheme of everything we had in motion, then I could make the appropriate decision for the publisher that aligned best for Mm -hmm. that mission. Yeah. And as new authors, or even if you've published a book or two, it's so, so important, I feel, to do that now. And I'm a big fan of putting all your best stuff in a book. Give it all away, all of your secrets away. The book needs to serve the reader 100%. Now, you might be thinking, well, I've got a 
thousand dollar course I want to sell after the book, or I've got this ten thousand dollar program I want them to buy after the book, which again, in a perfect world, will serve them correctly, help them realize their goals, but they may want to have some help. There's a percentage that are going to still say yes, a large enough percentage that it's worth it. And one thing, one challenge you might have is if you hold something back, and then they engage with you, and then you start revealing more. There's a distrust. They feel like you're always hiding something from them, or they feel like you're always trying to sell them something that they didn't know they need when you should really just lay it all out at, at the one at the one point. Um, the voice needs to be you. It needs to be exactly the way you speak on stage, the way you speak on the telephone, and the, the value needs to be the same, it needs to be very you know, straightforward. Um, but yeah, give it all the way in the book. Like Jeff Walker, we did, we had number one New York Times with Jeff Walker's book launch and others, of course, but you know, you could take that book and you could do exactly what he says and, and a number of the authors, exactly what they're doing and do it extremely successful. But most of us won't, <laughs> we're busy. So they may have a little do it for you or do it with you kind of opportunity, which is great. And that's real value for both of you. Exactly. And when we look at ourselves and we do that reflection, as you said, wow. are we, is the voice in our true reflective voice here? That was another key thing that resonated with me. I mean, I'm quirky dorky. It just is who I am. And yeah. our community knows that. And it's good. We talk about the fact that we love superhero movies, Austin and I, all of the time, oh my gosh. which is part of what sparked that love for writing this and a comic book lore approach, Silence Your Inner Critic, is very focused on a superhero, supervillain kind of plight through. But then when you meet authors and the book does not feel connected to the person you meet, it does create kind of that disconnect. So to me, that was such valuable advice too. I was like, okay, continue to be me. Unapologetically be who I am because that's what I'm asking others to be in the book too. Right. Yeah. So I can't go against my own advice. You know, it's funny, 15, 20, 50 years ago, nobody really cared about the author. You could write whatever you want and it didn't have to match who you were because nobody cared about who you were and there was no desire to connect with you. But today, uh, content is still King, but right next to the King of content is this queen of connection begging for attention. They want to have, we want to have access with those authority figures. And that's where it's really super important. It's exactly what you just said, that they need to be able to feel it's the same person, need to resonate and you need to give access and it's good for both parties, but you can't just get away with having great content. You've got to be engaged in that space. Yes. Now, if someone is an author and they're considering publishers and they would like to submit, I know I was told that agents are necessary now in order to submit for any publishing house. Is that also true for Morgan James? So we love agents and, and a good percentage of our books come from literary agents, uh, but it's not required from us. No. So you could come to us with a direct relationship in a perfect world. We would want to know who, how you heard about us. Cause that certainly opens some doors or gets things done, done faster. Uh, but no, it's not required. We just want to know who you are, what you're trying to do, how you found us, of course. And then the book, um, like for instance, if, if, if you want to get connected with us, then maybe just a, a, a personal referral from Amber would be amazing. She could, you could introduce us via email or something like that, or you could just go to the web and, and, you know, drop in a submission, but still tell us how you discovered us and whatnot. Um, but, um, to answer the official question is agents aren't required though. We do love agents. That's perfect. And so <laughs> if someone did decide because they don't know how to go the agent route to explore just direct submission or, they send us a message wherever they're listening to this and say, I would really love to explore more. What is your website so that they can get more information? We'll post it everywhere. But oftentimes people listen to podcasts and they're driving and it's like, I just want to make a mental note. So super simple. It's just Morgan James publishing.com. That's Morgan James publishing.com. <laughs> Such a good radio voice. I love it. My wife says I have a, a face for radio. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have a face for podcasting too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we'd be honored to look at anything that you guys want us to take. We'll give, we'll acknowledge it in writing. So you'll know we got it and we're looking at it. We'll try to give feedback and love. Now we can't do every book and not every book is right for us and not every publisher is right for every author, but we'll always try to help you figure out a good path. My passion 
though I have quit my day job as a banker by now, obviously, is I still very passionate about helping authors find their, their right path. So eager to re refer or connect authors to wherever they could be, you know, where they, wherever they could succeed if, if we're not a right fit. And we would always do it in love, of course. Which is why you're on the Heart Leader podcast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's a good fit. Now, with that being said, I think it's also important that everybody who is consuming this knows it isn't as though you just take on a mountain of books and crank them out. It would make it challenging for you to have this level of a relationship with your authors. So what does that process look like? How do you narrow down and decide and how many books do you take? Uh -huh. Well, that's, that's the challenge. That's probably the hardest part of our, of our job. I mean, the real fun is deepening that relationship, going through the creative process and then the marketing, the marketing is my fun part. You know, that relationship with the, the, the author, it's just, man, I thrive on that. But we do get thousands upon thousands upon thousands. In fact, we, I haven't counted since the pandemic, but we were getting about 5,500 submissions a year and we're publishing about 200. <laughs> so a large percentage doesn't make it, but it doesn't mean they're not great books. It just, for whatever reason, just wasn't you know a fit for us. So again, we want to encourage authors that uh, there is an opportunity. Um, close referrals always get looked at first, if, if that helps. So you know, that, that's really wonderful. But for us, we really still just narrow it down by the author, you know, as I alluded to, who are they, what are they doing and why, and how is it connected? You know, what, what does it support? What does it support big business, small business, an entrepreneurial venture, a faith message, a nonprofit? How does it fit the big picture? That's really, really important. And then we interview each author really just to get to know them. Cause we want to also feel like we can get connected with the author and just fall in love with them. Cause again, that's the big part for us. And then in a perfect world, we'll go through the book. We'll ask maybe some strategic questions. We may make some great suggestions. In fact, we just signed an, an author whose previous books have sold millions of copies. And we like, there was a piece of the book that really felt like we, that it needed. And we made the suggestion of like, oh my gosh, we were thinking about that, but we weren't how to implement it. That we, that's a great idea. Not that we like to get in the way and we don't want to change what the author is, but we've been doing this long enough to know that various things are very duplicatable that the readership is looking for, that we as authors, as close to the content as we are, it's easy to forget, even though it's core business kind of things, you know, getting the reader out of the book was basically what it is, is you've got to write a great book and you want to make sure that they have access to you, but uh, you can't anymore just be elusive about it. You can't just assume that they're going to check you out because you wrote, they, they read your book. You want to get them to leave the book early on, you know, give them a reason because that real relationship, that real value for them and you is connecting with you through the book. So find out a way to get out of the book or get the reader to leave the book and as early as possible. Um, and then it is a matter of fleshing out the details, making sure that we can help them realize their goals. Um, and are they coachable? That's very important. We want to be want them to be willing to do the things that successful authors do, but it doesn't mean that we want them to be willing to spend money or buy advertising or hire publicists because that may not help them get to their goal or may not help them realize it the way they think it is, but be coachable so that we can teach them the things that they could do to reach their big, hairy, audacious goal or the things they should do to hit their big goal. Or we spend just as much time with the authors on what they shouldn't do. Oh my gosh, don't do that. You know, it's like everybody else is doing it. Well, it's not, I'm not going to give you the goal, what you're thinking. You're just going to throw money away. Yeah. So that relationship is key if we can determine that. So it's, it's a, it's a process, but again, if we end up not, you know, pat or passing on it, just say hey, not right for us right now, or, or here's a better path to help you realize your goal, or just like you need to delete it and start up with a ghostwriter <laughs> in love, but uh, it's part of the process. Yeah. And we meet, we have five, a five person publication board. We meet every Wednesday and we just try to go through the books, you know, uh, where can we add value? Where can we add value? Which is amazing. And that also reflects that no matter what, you will get some type of value back by submitting to your organization. Because for me, a huge part of the process that I was navigating up until our agreement was submitting and sometimes receiving nothing back. We all think, oh, this is, my book is the best book too. And then we'll hold it and sure? then we'll be like, yay, best book. <laughs> but when you're submitting it and you get a rejection back, but you don't get any feedback on why it was rejected, that's also very challenging when you have some who love it and some who are rejecting it and you're confused. 
fortunately, I came from a, a background where I was somewhat accustomed to that and I didn't take it too personally. But now that I'm talking to so many other authors, that can really begin to weigh on your psyche oh if gosh. you have no idea, okay, well, why did you reject it? And it could be they just have too many in that genre right now and they can't fit it in. It yeah. doesn't mean your book isn't good. And so we can't take that rejection personally or as a reflection of what we've created. But when you have houses like yours that give that feedback, then it helps us kind of balance that inner critic that we have going on that always comes from receiving a no in some capacity. Our friends, Mark Victor Hansen and Jack Canfield, we actually published a couple of books with Mark. Um, they were rejected like 144 times for that first chicken soup for the soul book. So it takes a, takes a little thick skin and persistence uh, and knowing that when the message is right for you and your audience, you just got to be persistent and, and figure out a way to keep, keep pushing forward and staying encouraged. <laughs> I love that. And we just had our entrepreneurial vision mastermind call. That's right. It's so funny. We entrepreneurs love to name things. So that whole entrepreneurial vision mastermind thing is just the, the process that we do with each author, you know, one-on-one -on -one, making the decisions together, serving the big goals of the author and just starting that relationship. Right. But again, the name, the naming process is the funnest. <laughs> yeah. And it's very informative because we get a team together. It yeah. isn't as though it's two individuals just sitting there. There's an entire team and I was telling another fellow author who just released her book, I was like, I didn't realize launching a book, it really is like birthing something out into the world. It takes a lot of effort. Yeah. And there's that's no, where you have to lean on each other. Yeah. And there's no coincidence that it takes nine months to bring a book to market and it takes nine months to birth a baby. It's a process. <laughs> it really is. So as we're preparing to wrap up here, is there any advice that you would give to someone who is just starting the hunt for the path that's right for them, other than outlining their goals, obviously, and how this would fit in more on that internal or personal side of it, because that's outside of self. But often, and this is, again, why I wrote Silence Your Inner Critic, right? That inner critic rises up through that whole process and can just start to tear you apart. You've done this from both sides of the fence now. Do you have any advice that mm. someone could use inside to help that process? Absolutely. Because at, at various stages in your career as an entrepreneur, definitely as a, as a, as a writer, is there will come a point in the career or in the stage that you feel like an imposter? I mean, the imposter syndrome is real where you feel like, oh my gosh, am I the right person saying this? Will anybody listen to me? Do, do, do I have value? Are all these no's telling me that I really shouldn't be doing this? I want you to expect it. And, and one thing that, that really adds more injury on top of that, when you're starting to feel a little bit of self-doubt, again, as you're hitting send to submit it to publisher or as you're saying, hey, go you know, buy the book or something like that, is that those around you, people that love you and you love may also kind of come to you and say, oh my gosh, congratulations, Amber, the book is done. Wonderful. Now shut up. <laughs> now they, they may delicate, they may be more delicate to that, but you know, like they're just trying to protect you because they, you know, they see that most authors have a limited success. So they hear them talk about the book once because they waited and said, Hey, buy my book and versus add in value. Um, they realize that most authors fail, unfortunately. So they're, they're like trying to protect you. Hey, maybe let's talk about something else or, Hey, let's, you know, go back to doing what we were doing before you started writing this book six years ago. And it could be a spouse. It could be a coach. It could be your best friend. It could be your neighbor's dog. You'd have to listen carefully for that one. Um, but I want you to expect that it's going to happen. And when it does, I want you to embrace it because it will happen to all of us. But here's the positive thing that can happen when people start to poo poo on your parade, or you start to have some self doubt is recognize that if you continue forward without changing anything, that's where the magic starts to happen. That's where you break through the boundaries that most authors can't get past. That's when you break into the realm of people are getting to that 25th, 26th, 27th time hearing about you or the message uh, or the concept that they're ready to have engagement. If you haven't read the parables, Three Feet from Gold or Acres of Diamonds, just go Google them. They're real. A lot of authors will pivot right there at that last minute, and then you start all over again. 
you know, a whole message from a different avenue. And then when you get to that pivotal point again, those friends will come back to you and say, ah, this has been wonderful. Maybe you should talk about something else or shut up. You already, you know, your book is already out. So it's five years old now, you know, kind of thing. Embrace it, expect it, love those who come to you with that discouraging news more than ever because they love you. Just embrace them, but you keep moving forward. <laughs> I love that. And it's true. I'm just at the beginning part of it. And there are already individuals who are, okay, I've silenced yeah. my inner critic. <laughs> what does that mean? But it is such a positive process too. And yeah. one that we can learn so much about ourselves through. And that has been the most enjoyable part. And to be with a group that feels like we're all in it together to me, the sky is the limit. All I can see is amazing things on the horizon. Yeah. So I sincerely appreciate you and the time you took with me initially and now being part of the Morgan James family. And again, individuals can go to morganjamespublishing.com. Right. And not only find out more about how to publish with you, but you have so many amazing authors ones I can now call family. That's right. Family, fellow authors who are out there offering such amazing books. So I would encourage that as well. Oh, it's so much fun. In fact, um, part of what we do as a publisher is put all of our authors in one group where they can connect with each other, encourage each other, support each other. And they're speaking on each other's stages and podcasts. They're lifting each other up. They're sharing tactics, things that are working, things that are not working. And it's just so much fun. Our, our peers in publishing said, oh my gosh, you should never put all your authors in one room. They'll talk about you. I'm like, well, I hope they do. And if I need to fix something, I will, but that would help them serve each other. You know? <laughs> it's so much fun. So Amber, if you haven't gotten engaged there yet, definitely pop in and say hi, and you'll be the onslaught of new friends eager to help you. Yep. I'm in there and we're already chatting it up. We've talked about imposter syndrome and all the other things that you've already chatted about. It's, it's real. It's true. And whether it's in writing a book or it's in something else, we all navigate it. Yeah. And I feel like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but maybe that's why you felt Silence Your Inner Critic would be a book that fit under the publishing house because our goal is to navigate that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Love what you're doing. Well, it's a mutual admiration society. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I really thank you for your time. And we'll make certain that even if somebody wasn't able to write down the address when they were listening, that it's posted every which direction and they can quickly get to and explore all of the amazingness that Morgan James is bringing into the world. Awesome. Well, I'd be honored. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Thank you. Thank you.